After the end of the Civil War, the state of Kansas was terrified by a group of murderers. To make matters more unsettling, these murderers were discovered to all be part of the same family. But before they could be caught and brought to justice, they disappeared without a trace. Today, we look into what some people consider to be the first case of serial killings in the United States, the Bloody Benders. This is Red Web. Well, hello there, Task Force. Welcome to another episode of Red Web. I'm Trevor Collins. With me, as always, Alfredo Diaz. Fredo, I feel like we joke a lot about this being the number mm -hmm. one movie podcast about mysteries. Right. But sincerely, I would be surprised if there isn't a movie made on this very case. Mm-hmm. Hold on. Photo being taken. <laughs> um, a photo of Christian, no less. What are you doing? No, 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 uh, Trevor, just no, no, no uh, just documenting. I'll explain in a second, Trevor, proceed. <laughs> I'm just saying, this feels like it needs to be a movie with how many twists and turns, and I'm going to go go ahead and throw this one out there, a little piece of uh, juicy mm -hmm. bait. There's a bonus theory at the end of this that throws it all in, up into turmoil. Oh, geez. Raises a lot of questions, so I'm very excited for that one, so stick around. But um, what's the business? What's the photo for? Oh, I mean, you, you know, you're talking about like this deserves to be a movie mm, yeah movie podcast right, right. about mysteries i couldn't help but notice that christian's wearing a ted lasso shirt mm, fantastic yeah. show and i Damn thought to myself right. i'm gonna snap a photo just in case i want to wear a shirt that has christian wearing a shirt of ted lasso. <laughs> right right you know <laughs> I was nah. like, I'll, I'll never know if I need to, but just like I can now. <laughs> but if now. the need arises, right, you know, I can. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Brand new. I love this bad boy. Just it's a good picture shirt, of Ted. Yeah. And what's a show but just a long movie drawn out over weeks? <laughs> All right. So let's talk about the Bloody Benders. Some people consider this to be the first case of serial killings in the United States. It gets pretty hairy. It's pretty wild, but it feels literally like uh, akin to like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Have you ever heard of this one? No, um, just like everything on the show. Yeah, that's what that's the role you're in. <laughs> uh, which you know, uh, now I'm exposed to all of it. it. There's two things that hit me pretty hard here. Mm -hmm. One, first, like, could possibly be the first case of serial killings. Yeah, that's, many people, many victims. Here. That's big. Yeah, that's big. Um, I'm very interested to see, like, honestly, how it's like. Okay, like a serial killer. How does that like? term come into like play like who did was it the police that said it or whatever like yeah you know what i mean that kind of like uh you know uh deep dive into it but then also is this the first family that we've had that kills like we've had I groups like mobs and so. stuff this it's usually families I'm, that are the victims right yeah, a lot of I'm family victims pretty yeah. sure this is the first time we've had a family that yeah. kills. I think you might be right. Which I was like, whoa, this yeah. is some movie stuff. Outside of like, if you want to blur the lines with like things like Amityville, where it's like within the family, uh, but it's against yeah. itself, right? Yeah, I feel like that's, yeah, against themselves. Yeah. Like, this is like, like, how do you even oh, yeah. convince? How do you get away I guess with the, it? I guess with the children, you bring them up that way. Yeah. You know what I mean? I guess so. Twisted uh, minds. But that's part of that. I mean, I don't want to say too much, but that is part of the bonus theory. I mean, oh, okay. I'm very this, eager to this, talk about this that. This is going to be exciting because there's so many, there's so many things I want to dive into. Yeah. Like how do you yeah, yeah, convince, yeah. well, one person, but then also like to find a spouse or convince mm -hmm. a spouse. Nowadays. Absolutely. Nowadays you have the internet. Sure. You can but find this, anybody doing anything. Right. This is way back this when. This is the 1800s. Before a lot of that tech. Right. Um, was even invented. But. Like, I guess, like, you can try and convince and raise and force your kids, but, like, right. to actually do it is, like, and do it multiple times? Mm -hmm. not, like, how do you, oh, man, that's, I got It's questions. weird, man. It's like, weird. I, I see what you're weird. on about. It's pretty, like, extreme. Like, how do you, like, even after reading about this, I'm like, how does one find themselves in this predicament or this position? But with that said, let's just dive in here. We're, we're going to talk about some of the family background and then kind of how this unfolded. So... I'm going to take you all the way back to October of 1870. The Bender family moved onto a piece of property, 160 acres near Cherryvale in southeast Kansas. And they were able to do this because of the Homestead Act of 1862. Basically, very, very brief U.S. history here. After the Civil War, the country allowed any adult citizen or intended citizen who had never borne arms against the U.S. to claim upwards of 160 acres of surveyed government property. So you could kind of take that on, become a farmer, till the land, what have you, develop it, whatever you wanted to do with it. That's how they 
receive that land. Wait, so you can just go to an empty plot of land and go, this is my land? I, I, I don't know the process about it, but <laughs> more or less, yeah. It was a way to kind of help people get a start. It was a way to reward people that never had right. turned on its own government. Mm -hmm. I mean, right after the Civil War and everything. Yeah, it seems like it's kind of along that line. I'm sure there's like intricate details about, you know, and rules and laws and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. About how to go about it. But that just sounds wild to me. It's like, yo, you claiming your land? You right. got land to claim. Like, what kind of paperwork are we looking at? Right. Here? It's like, I mean, like how much land are you claiming? Like, what do you plan to do with your land? 160 like, acres. That's a massive. That's a lot. So when it comes to the benders themselves, the property that they garnered, that 160 acres, was along the indigenous Osage Trail. We're going to talk about this trail a lot. But now let's talk about the family. We have John Bender Sr., who was in his 60s. We also have John Jr., who was 25. They moved in first, and they began building their cabin that would become their home. Once the home was ready in 1871, Mother Elvira, a.k.a. Ma, who was 55, and the daughter, Kate, who was 23, followed in, and then they moved over. Yeah, so we have a family of four. Okay, 60, 55, 25, 23. Yes. Senior was in his 60s. We don't know okay. exactly his age at this time, but but yeah, more or less. Now, the Benders were thought to be German immigrants. John Senior was not very good at English. And when it came to John Jr., there was something that the locals noticed that kind of raised suspicions about John Jr. is that he would tend to... He had this habit of randomly bursting out into fits of laughter. It's kind of like the Joker, if you yeah. will. And so it kind of got a lot of people's attention. They didn't really know why it was that person's like disposition, but that was just an interesting piece about mm. John Jr. However, when it came to his English, he could speak fluent English just with a German accent. And that's where he, a lot of the German kind of theory comes through. Ma was known to be very unfriendly, so her neighbors actually nicknamed her She-Devil. Jesus. Pretty harsh. Yeah. yeah. But you'll kind of get a little bit of Ma's personality <laughs> later on, just a little window of it. Oh, man. Yeah. Now, Kate is interesting. She's the youngest of the family. She was also the most fluent English speaker. But the reason I, I, I say she's interesting is because she worked as a self-proclaimed healer and psychic. So oh. now, now we're starting to realize that this family does have a bit of uh, unique characteristics about them, whether it be their disposition towards their neighbor, yeah. John Jr. kind of going into fits of laughter periodically, or now the daughter being a self-proclaimed psychic. She said that she could speak to the dead as a type of medium of sorts. Interesting. Now, in my mind, obviously, we'll find out or not. In my mm -hmm. mind, I'm curious as to, like, if that plays a bigger role in terms of why they kill. It, it may. Mm. It may. It's it's interest, It's an interesting question because then it's like, is this correlated with their incoming acts mm -hmm. or is it a cause of their incoming acts? It's hard to know. Right. Now, it's worth mentioning this. This community in this area was filled with spiritual families. Many of these families would actually hold seances periodically, and even in such a particular community, her practices were seen as strange due to, once again, her self-proclaimed, and I use air quotes here, value of free love. So it wasn't spiritual in the normal sense, I, I should say, mm -hmm. in the community's sense, but in her own way. So this drew many people to the Bender property seeking Kate's so-called expertise making her the face of the family's business ventures. The front half of the home that they had built was used as a general store, restaurant, and an inn where travelers could stop on their routes, while the back half of the cabin remained the Bender's living quarters. In order to separate these two halves, they used a canvas curtain that we'll refer to later, but it kind of just hung in between to act as a little just a divider, I guess. That's it? Yeah. Oh, that's weird. It sounds like something personal. Real personal is happening in the back half of this inn. Right. No, no, no. no. Don't it's, worry about that. Just, that's just Ma. Yeah. I, that doesn't do anything. Yeah. Except just, uh, you can hear everything. Right, right. It, is, so, is someone someone coughing back there? Are they, what, are they, right. <laughs> I don't know. So, I, don't, so. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what they're doing back there. You heavily <laughs> breathing? <laughs> Macking on some dinner? I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to sleep out here. But interesting to see that, like, okay. Because I was like, okay, it's a family. Yeah. Um, it kills, murders. We don't know that yet. Oh, true. I mean, we do, but we don't. Right, right. We don't know that yet. They got an but, inn, a restaurant, but I was a like, store. How, how are they getting people? Now we know. Yeah, now we know. Businesses. And this, businesses. the Osage Trail that I referred to yeah. is very common. It's a very commonly trafficked, I should say. Yeah. So 
They got, you so know. So it'd be like nowadays, right off the highway. Right. Holiday Inn, looking at it a little bit differently now. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit different. But I do want to say, too, before we get into the weeds, it's important to note that during this time period, it would not be uncommon for travelers to go missing. But people in Cherryvale grew concerned as locals started to become some of those who went missing. So it wasn't Aww. just travelers in the area. Now their people are going, wait a minute, locals are going missing. They're not traveling around. It's not normal for people to just disappear. Uh, like, I mean, we talked about it before many episodes, but you could get away with a lot back then. Definitely. Um, Definitely. So why, why, why push your luck? I think, I think that's the thing is as we kind of digest this case, we'll find that they just messed with the wrong person because otherwise oh. it, it seemed like they were just scot-free. We're yeah. picking off travelers, right? No one is going to know for months no one's and they know. won't know here. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's a good segue into the town's investigation because as townspeople were continuing to grow suspicious, one specific disappearance is what sparked off the investigation because oh. they had clearly gotten confidence. Oh, that's juicy. Oh, yeah. So George Newton Longcore, sometimes referred to as Launcher, disappeared after traveling from Kansas to Iowa with his 18-month-old daughter, Marianne. No. I know. I know. So Dr. William Henry York, Longcore's neighbor in Kansas, sold Longcore horses and a wagon in order to make this move in late 1872. Because Longcore was traveling with no one but his infant daughter and disappearances on the trail were apparently increasing, York asked Longcore to write him so that he would know when they hit their destination that everything was fine, that they made it okay, and that they didn't disappear. Of course, as you can imagine, York never heard from Longcore, but did hear that the horses and wagon were found abandoned around Fort Scott, Kansas. So in the spring now, of 1873. That would be a few months on from York sending out Longcore. York then went searching for Longcore to figure out what went down. And man, I just want to say props to this guy as a neighbor. We could all use neighbors like York. That's wild. Yeah. This neighbor cares about Very much. their fellow neighbor mm -hmm. and is going above and beyond. Absolutely. He's a doctor, I think, too. I should start calling him Dr. York. But Damn. Dr. York took the Osage Trail all the way to Fort Scott, where he not only found the wagon and the horses that he had sold to Longcore, but he also found the clothes belonging to Longcore and Marianne, the 18-month-old daughter. So wait, where did he find the abandoned... That would have all been at the end of the trail there in Fort Scott, there in Kansas. So like in sheriff's custody or just like that's in a good a question town? do we do we know do we, we just know that they were found abandoned mm -hmm. and i'm sure maybe local authorities kind of kept a hold yeah. of it to see if anyone came claiming it that's what i'm assuming like went down yeah talked to local authorities and be like i was a neighbor mm -hmm. i sold them these horses of this color or whatever right and it was like oh my goodness this is their stuff Ooh, that's really unsettling at this point you gotta know dr yeah. york is like Oh man. But this oh, is man. There's a little like detail here. Um do we know how long this trail is? That's a good question. Because I mean it stretches like, a few states. But oh, man. we also okay. have a global task force. We want to make sure Right. Well, I mean, I mean knowing that it's a it stretches a few states is, is enough for yeah. like where I was going with it. And that being like, okay, is the trail big enough? And it is. And so it's like, how do you even I'm very curious, and we're getting there, but mm -hmm. I'm very curious as to how they pinpoint the family. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On a trail that spans multiple states. Right. Like, it could happen at any point exactly. in time. Exactly. I mean, it's a very good they're point. They're traveling on a horse. They're not driving. Right, right. They're not flying. Okay. I think there's a, yeah, like, like you said, a few things are coming to kind of correlate this, but basically people started pinpointing it based on anecdotal experience, what people were seeing along the trail. You could say, I saw them at point A, but not point B kind of thing. Man, you really got that's feels like such a slow investigation. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. And and it's also worth noting that a lot of people started avoiding this trail altogether because of exactly what you're saying. They didn't know where on this trail people were disappearing yep. or who was causing it. So people just started talking and saying, let's just avoid that trail. Now, this is where Dr. York turned around to head home. Now, interestingly enough, he decided to stop at Bender Inn along his way and was never seen again. Damn. Mm-hmm. Damn it. That is unfortunate. It really is. So. Or is it? I, I mean. I'm going to say, this is juicy. It's very juicy. <laughs> like, we, like, this, this is a damn movie. 
We talk about it a lot, but I mean, I'm sitting here thinking I've cool. I'm buckled in. These are the main. Nope. This is the main <laughs> character. Nope. That's, so who the hell is the main character at this point? Right. There are right. psycho like, vibes right now. Right. Yeah. We're getting and, to act three and we got three main characters. Already. Right. Yeah. And so I'm just like, who's going to step up and pick this up? And how does this like catch fire? Oh, and, don't oh, you worry. Man. The Yorks aren't out of the picture yet. I was not expecting the doctor to get got. <laughs> he got got. This is crazy. <laughs> it is. So stops a bender in. He's never seen again. Now uh. he knows better. He knows that this trail has people disappearing. He's out looking for his neighbor and his young, young daughter. He's never seen again. Now, Dr. York came from an affluent family. Again, I think the Benders messed with the wrong folks. Both of his brothers, Colonel Ed York and Alexander M. York, were part of the Kansas Senate. The brothers quickly put a search party together, which consisted of 75 men. In March of 1873, they tracked Dr. York all the way down to specifically Bender Inn. Oh, yeah, man, you, well, ooh, that's really the wrong person. Exactly. And it, and it all started with just a well-meaning neighbor, you know? With connections. With connections, absolutely. Like family ties. Wow. Talk about luck. I mean, granted, when, you know, during the um, beginning of this episode, you're talking about Oh, they're never seen again. But would they have ever been caught? That's the question. If Look, this if like, this particular incident hadn't gone right. down, it is entirely possible. That's such a unique situation. How That's, many families out there didn't get caught? Right. You know? Yeah, okay. Oh, oh. oh damn, you got me thinking about that now. Okay, so this search party of 75 people went out. They pinpointed Bender Inn in March of 1873. And when confronted, the family, the Bender family, denied ever meeting Dr. York and directed them to Drum Creek, where John Jr. claimed to have been shot around the same time as York's disappearance. It's worth mentioning, though, you know, again, we're deep in the 1800s here, and I think what the family was trying to do was get the Yorks off their back. They wanted to get them turning and looking at other people, and they wanted to levy the racism of the time yeah. to get them looking at local tribes in the area. Just whatever they could do to get them off the Bender family's yeah. path. And and like knowing that that it's like an, you know, unfortunately an easy sell. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, they'd be like, hey, there's a bunch of indigenous families along this trail just over there. Right. Like, you should be looking over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what they try to do to try to get this search party off their butts. And now... You know, I think they probably investigated that or what have you, but with no evidence, the search party kind of had to disband. They had to leave. Damn. Later down the line, the brothers actually stumbled upon multiple people who claimed that the Benders had threatened and in some cases tried to kill them. And so this is where the tables start to turn. This is where they go, okay, no, it is in fact the Benders family because of the anecdotal evidence from these people who have survived the Benders in. They're going, hey, I almost got clubbed in the head. Or, hey, I was verbally threatened by one of the family members. Like, you got to look at that family closer. Wait, because there's a big difference between I got into a violent argument with mm -hmm. the Benders mm -hmm. and I left and they tried to kill me yeah. and yeah. I escaped. So some they're actual victims that yes. got away. Some people were just threatened and some people experienced an attempted murder, 100%. And I don't know why they're not reporting that. Like, they, they tried to kill me. What? Now, it is a different time. Right. It's a wildly different time. It's hard to conceive of. Just, but I'm sure they're like, I guess it was technically their property. And I guess technically I was staying at their place. And so I would still report that. I'm upset, but I'm going to bounce. But if I report it, the authorities are probably going to be like, it's their land. This still doesn't give you the right to I know, kill. It, that, I agree. That's insane. I agree. And huh? it doesn't because of what comes next. But it, it, is probably why people didn't widely report it, right. which is astounding. See, now they're just now they're getting sloppy, you know. It's true. I just I thought they built up a habit and confidence, and right. Uh, I was like, all right, it's a family killing people. I was like, all right, it's a filet mignon. <laughs> wait, you know, like, wait, wait, wait. And then <laughs> break that one down. You know what I Hold mean? On. Why are we talking nice, about these juicy pieces? Nice, of meat? <laughs> nice clean meal. <laughs> And then, and what? then I find out I'm lost in the that, metaphor. That, that it's, they're it's all then they're going tracking. after town people. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, it's not a fancy piece of meat; it's just a cheeseburger. <laughs> yeah, I like a good cheeseburger. And now, though. and now that people are getting away 
knowing that they were uh, about to be murdered uh-huh, and they're uh-huh. just being violent towards whoever, whenever they feel like it. Right, right. Sloppy Joe. Now, oh, we're talking about a sloppy Joe. <laughs> Come on, man. That's, that's at most 30% meat. This is ridiculous. It's wild. You know what? Your metaphor <laughs> landed at the end. It was You were like a gymnast tumbling in the air, but I don't know what you did in the air, but Who man, you stuck the landing. Where was it going to land? I'll tell you what. I didn't know. <laughs> you stuck the landing, but in the crowd. I didn't know. You <laughs> <he> landed. <laughs> that's all that matters. All that you know matters. what? Thank you for coming home. You, you landed. <laughs> all right. So clearly at this point, this search party is like, great. The benders have something to do with this. We really need to investigate this. Now, let's flash forward just a month. April 3rd, 1873. The Yorks, along with a team of armed men, went back to the inn to once again re-question the benders with newfound evidence and eyewitness reports. Colonel York confronted the family about a woman who claimed Elvira, this is Ma, by the way, threatened her with knives and pistols. At first, Elvira pretended to have no idea what he was referring to, But when York asked again, she began yelling about how the woman tried to curse her coffee or insulted her coffee, I should say. Okay. And at this point, the Yorks are going, bingo, Elvira was in fact fluent in English and you've been putting on a kind of facade, like you've been lying. You're putting on a character. We know you understand us, so what else are you not telling us? Whoa. Okay, the dad didn't speak English. The mom... So yeah, let me let me go back through that. Dad it didn't is, speak English. The senior mom. was not very good with English. Mm-hmm. Junior was pretty pretty good. fluent. Daughter was like English. Kate was the best. I actually don't have notes on how well Ma spoke English. Oh. I just have a note on her being unfriendly. Oh, Do we know Christian if her English was well? Basically, based on it this seems revelation, like it was, you're right. Right. It seems like Mom was putting on an yeah, act. Yeah. And then switched it up in a fit of rage. Yeah. I I imagine she wasn't that good at English, Mm -hmm. given her age, given her age proximity to to a senior who was also not that great at English. Yeah, it was said that Ma Elvira was also not a good English speaker. Well, until this revelation. And then when they go, wait a minute, you're fluent in English. Elvira then proceeded to kick them out after that revelation. Kate, the daughter, then tried to alleviate the situation by offering to use her psychic abilities to contact Dr. York's spirit or ghost to help find his body. She told the group to return on Friday night without the armed men, and she would then lead them to the body. And I'm like, first of all, Bruh. that's very specific. Why in the dark? Why without the arms? And how do you know? Bruh. Hit me with it. This just turned to a can of spam. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Uh, this is a Beyond Meat uh, patty. On my murder finesse scale... <laughs> It's <laughs> a, a, a damn can of spam. Are you kidding? Like how? That's ridiculous, dude. Yeah. yeah Come yeah, yeah. back without the armed people. Come on in back In the now. middle of the night, mm-hmm. I'm gonna use Give my me a few psychic days. abilities. Right, 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 right. And show you where the body is. Right, right. You. I'm, I feel like that's a confession. <laughs> right? Like I feel, I feel like, like we just got a confession. Right. I feel like. <laughs> You, you immediately go, no, I don't think I'm going to do that. I think you're going to show me right now. This story is <laughs> crazy. <laughs> all right. So at this point, surrounding communities are starting to throw accusations all over the place, whether mm. it be this family or the indigenous Americans nearby, what have you. Things are going a little haywire. So the local township held a public meeting to discuss how they should address this situation. Here, the community agreed to obtain search warrants so they could legally search every property between Big Hill Creek and Drum Creek, and hopefully they could locate the missing people. The elected township officer, Leroy Dick, was sent to the Bender property when animals were recognized as malnourished or simply dead in the field by one of the locals. When Dick arrived, he found the property had been abandoned, but noticed a horrible smell coming from beneath one of the beds. He then goes in, checks under the beds. Dick found a trap door, which was now nailed shut. Dick called in a hundred people to search this property and to investigate what they could find. They uncovered the trap door, which led to an empty room filled with clotted blood stains that had seeped through the stone floor and into the soil. However, they found no bodies in this room. Man, it just keeps getting better. Right? They found the murder room, but doubt the bodies. Doubt the bodies. Where are the bodies? Where are these bodies at? 
Now we're going back up the scale. This is ridiculous. <laughs> Are we back at Burger Town? Like, what's happening? <laughs> we're back at Sloppy Joe. <laughs> oh, it's still I a sloppy. I'll be honest. I didn't think you can go back and forth on the scale. But, yeah. like, yeah, the bodies aren't there. Where else? Bodies are aren't there. I feel... Okay. Well, then they, they, I mean, we have a hundred people now on property right. starting to search. So the search oh, party then proceeds. A lot of people. Very large sum of people. Group. They're searching the yard. They're searching the vegetable garden. They're searching the apple orchard. Remember, this is 160 acres of goodness. And in this case, not goodness, but I'm just, yeah, yeah. it's land, right? Yeah. It could be, it could be fertile, right? A lot of right? land. So they've got a lot of things going on. They actually found Dr. York buried in the apple orchard. So boom, immediately we got a red hot trail. Ooh. We know that these people were at the center of a lot of disappearances. It's now just a question of who and how many. Oh. So over the course of the next 24 hours, 10 more bodies were unearthed from the same location. There were also isolated body parts indicating that more people had been gruesomely murdered on this property. The bodies all represented the same MO, the modus operandi of being bludgeoned in the head and having their throat slit. Marianne's body was actually the only one without these wounds, which led a lot of people to believe that she may have, and I'm just gonna pause for a second because it's so gruesome, might have been buried alive, the 18 month old. <gasps> burn so, these people, burn them alive. Right, well, that's the thing is, where did they go? <sighs> After what was discovered, the York brothers offered up a suitable reward for anyone who found and captured the Bender family. Officers found actually their horses used by the vendors that were abandoned 12 miles north of their home, kind of either saying that they were abandoned and just walked that way or indicating that maybe the family, that was the vector that they left. So what's 12 miles north? That's the beginning of our search. From there though, I mean, outside of the horses 12 miles north, the rest is speculation. But what is known for sure is that upwards of 12 men were an accessory to these crimes. That's wild now now we got people outside the family being part of these crimes they help the benders get rid of the items that they stole off these bodies etc and the way we know this is because there was a vigilante named mitt cherry who was one of the 12 and he even wrote a letter on behalf of a victim addressed to his wife basically when they killed somebody they wanted to write a letter back to the wife of the victim to make it seem that that person was still alive and that that person had reached their destination and this Mitt Cherry was the person to have done that. And that's how we got these 12 people involved. This has evolved and devolved in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. So there's 12 people involved. Yeah. And they're yeah, essentially like a murdering organization. Yeah. Kind of. Right? Like they're just, they've got like a whole business on murdering going on right here. It's some real Sweeney Todd stuff. You I come mean, to do some business, maybe buy a, an apple take a, a little sleep in a little bed. Yeah. You know, and uh, you get popped in the night and have all your goodies taken. Well, I think what's so absolutely insane to me is that this, essentially at this point, what, 16 people that are like down with murder? Um, and I'm sure like they probably sold their belongings sure. and all that kind of stuff. So like you, you have 16 people that are murdering or willing to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. But it's not like a crime organization. No. No, it doesn't seem well-oiled much at all. It's just kind of a family doing their deeds and right. finding other... But it's not like we're murdering and like... For, not necessarily for profit or like territory control. It almost seems like, like let's just power. take their goods, but otherwise this is fun. Yeah, it's just like, let's just like 16 people are like, yeah, y'all do the murdering, we'll sell some stuff, and that's just kind of the business that we're in. We just let's shake hands and do the thing. Yeah. And that that's so unique. I it feel it like. really is. The fact that we don't have a straight up motive, like what they are right. actually after, it's scary. Really. I mean, we have a, a family of interesting characters that mm -hmm. are all kind of like just doing I, this what seems like for sport i don't know it, it's such a like twist the fact that other people are involved but also 12 other people and like i said they're kind of running like a business they have one like different people doing different things one person writing letters home like mm -hmm. that's, how those guys get involved how did they not right turn coat and turn them in but also like i don't know how do you consistently find out the information of like where their home is yeah and who they like Maybe that person was, they, they got lucky with it. 
Yeah. They talked to him and said, where's your wife? What's your address? True. Maybe, or maybe he's got ID on him. Yeah. Another random question. You said they found their horses like yeah. 12 miles mm -hmm. away. I'm assuming it's like the horseshoes, but how do they know it was their horses? That is a really good question. I think it, it's just the look of them. They have the same kind of malnourishment look to them, the same color scheme. And it could be, it could be things like brandings. It could yeah, be things like horseshoes, brandings, yeah. but either way, it was a factual identification. Like yeah. they, they knew that is a good question. Yeah. I was just very curious. Like it's, these are their horses. I'm like, how the hell do you know yeah. that? So apparently there's a little more information regarding how they started tracking them. They were apparently trying to follow the wagon tracks from the, the family's Got wagon. It. The wagon had been missing. And then following those tracks is what led them to the to the group of horses. Mm. So I think oh. it was just kind of making that connection. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like. Well, then where'd the wagon go? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Man, I wonder if they didn't do like a, hey, chap, you want a free wagon? Switcheroo. It's just saddled with a bunch of uh, fingerprints. But that's it. Yeah. It's that's... free. Like who turns down a free wagon these days? Right. In this economy? Hello, Task Force. It's Trevor coming right to your ear holes. Okay, I won't say it that weird. Coming right to your eardrums. Leave it all in, Nick Bot. This is Candid. That's how we do these ad reads. And uh, just want to talk to you about a little bit of what's going on in the Red Web sphere. In case you've been out of the loop or in the loop, you might hear this again. But Case Files is coming out next week, so mark your calendars. It comes out 24 hours early for our firsties over at roosterteeth.com. If you want to get it on your Thanksgiving day, otherwise head over to youtube.com slash redwebpod, subscribe, hit that bell, do all that good stuff, and it will come out on Friday, the one right after that. I believe that's the 25th, if I can count that high. But if you subscribe, you will never miss an episode or an upload from us. That's just another way to engage with us. So thank you all so much for everybody who has jumped over to that channel and helped juice it up. Also, hey, if you're already subscribed, you're going to see this one coming. It might have already come out. But uh, as of the moment I'm recording this ad read, we did a whole live stream kind of watching over the Penhurst Asylum ghost investigation that we did. If you missed that, that is also going to hit that YouTube channel so you can see all the behind the scenes stuff, us talking about what we saw. And that's actually going to dovetail nicely into that case files that's coming out because that is where we're going to look into all the stuff we missed, all the sights and sounds and curiosities that you guys had in the comments with the timestamps and everything. We're going to break all those down in that case file. So that's what's going on with us. I hope you all have a fantastic beginning to your holiday season. It's all kind of sparking up and continuing to happen right now. And if you're looking for any gifts for anybody, anybody that loves mysteries, feel free to give them the free gift of sharing this podcast. We would greatly appreciate it. If you want to go one step further, of course, we're grateful for that too. You can go to store.roosterteeth.com and click on the Red Web tab up at the top under podcasts and check out all the merch that we have available still. I can't speak to it because some of it's already sold out because you're amazing, but others are still there. But otherwise, just sharing the podcast is enough. Thank you all very much. And with that said, here are some of our sponsors. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by BetterHelp. Life doesn't come with a user manual, unfortunately, so when things aren't working for you, it's normal to feel stuck. Navigating any of life's challenges can make you feel unsure, whether it's a career change, a new relationship, or becoming a parent. There's a lot of things that go on in life. Therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills, which makes therapy the closest thing to a guided tour of the complex engine called you. BetterHelp has connected over 3 million people with licensed therapists. It's convenient and accessible anywhere, 100% online. I really appreciated their website. I jumped onto that website to figure out how it all works as a new user. They give you a nice and easy survey so they can figure out how to help you specifically with your needs, whatever the challenges that you are facing in life. I really appreciated that it was so simple to use and so easy to find a licensed therapist so easily. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available again, 100% online. Plus it's affordable. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist at any time. It couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. If you're like me and you have any sort of social anxiety, you don't have to deal with that either because you don't even have to have your camera on, okay? So if that interests you, you can learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash redweb. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash redweb. This episode of Red Web is also sponsored by Uncommon Goods. The holidays are here, and you know how difficult making a unique gift choice can be. Trying to find just the right thing for your loved one to have something that is special for them. Well, we have a secret weapon for you. 
uncommon goods. They scour the globe looking for truly unique gifts that are high quality, unique, and often handmade. And they have something for everyone on your list, whether it's your family or your secret Santa. They've got all kinds of fun stuff from art and jewelry to kitchen, home, and bar. Plus, when you shop at Uncommon Goods, you're supporting artists and small independent businesses. And with every purchase you make, they give back $1 to a nonprofit partner of your choice. I was actually shopping on Uncommon Goods and I picked up the uh, the old school, it's like a retro reel viewer. It's one of those old things where you got the disc of images, you put them in a little viewfinder and then you click the button on the side and it rotates through it. I just like that because it reminds me of my childhood and it's something that I can put on my coffee table and share some of the photos with me and my family. And anybody that comes to my house, they can just look at that. And I really appreciate that it came super fast as well uh, with free shipping, no less. So that was really nice. I also got uh, just, well, I'm just riffing now. I also just snuck in some essential oils because a boy likes his smells. So they really do have a lot of stuff on there if you're interested. Now, if you want to get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash redweb. Once again, that's uncommongoods.com slash redweb for 15% off. You don't want to miss out on this limited time offer, especially with the holidays coming and all those amazing options for you, your family, and your loved ones. Uncommon Goods. We're all out of the ordinary. This episode of Red Web is also sponsored by Upside. Inflation is hitting us where it hurts right now. I know I don't need to dive into that, but whether it's going to the gas station or simply paying $20 for a sandwich, it's getting pretty wild out there, and that's why there's Upside. Upside is an app for anyone who buys gas, groceries, or dines out, because with every purchase, you can earn cash back. I really enjoy how simple the Upside app is to use. Simply, when you pull it up, uh, you claim your offer, you pay as usual, you check in, you submit your receipt, and then you get cash back for all the purchases that you would have made otherwise. And if you don't know where this is accepted, they have an easy to use button that I deeply appreciate because I get lost all the time and that you can just click that and it shows all of the viable places in your local city, town, or wherever that will allow you to use this service and get, once again, cash back on anything that you're already spending money on. It's pretty clever. In order to get the app, simply go to the App Store on your relevant device, search Upside, go ahead and download that to your phone. It's perfectly free. Claim your offer for whatever you're buying and then check in at that business. Don't forget to do that. Pay as usual, whether it be credit or debit, then you simply get your cash back. It's so wonderful. Download the free Upside app today and use promo code REDWEB if you want to get an extra $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Once again, if you want to get a juicy, nice, $5 $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Use promo code REDWEB once you've downloaded this and made your first purchase. The upside is the cash back. And with that said, let's dive right back into the mystery. Now, here's the thing. When it came to try to figure out where these benders went, authorities offered reward money of $2,000 equal to about $50,000 in today's currency. Good chunk. But they had no luck in tracking the benders down. In fact, we're going to talk about maybe where they went and how the family might have split up and where they might have gone in one of the theories. And I also want to remind you, as twisty and turny as this whole journey has been, there's a really interesting, like I said, bonus theory at the very end that throws all of these twists just up in the air again. It's it's a wild one. I'm very eager to get there. I wonder if they got murdered. Ooh, that's an interesting one. All right. But ultimately, here's here's kind of how this process went, because using evidence and eyewitness reports of those who did escape the inn, there was a supposed killing ritual, and this is how it is theorized to have gone. So the, quote, guests of honor would be seated at the head of the table there at the Bender Inn, with the dividing curtain at their backs. Remember that canvas curtain that separated uh, business from personal? Come on, man, yeah. you don't sit like that. They sat with their back to it. Kate would then distract them while the other family members would hide behind the curtain. Now, looking through the curtain, it was actually pretty easy to figure out where the victim and the victim's head in particular was because it was pretty thin. It was sheer. Now, at this point, one of the family members would then take a hammer and slam it into the victim's skull from behind. And if one blow from the hammer didn't do the job, one of the other men sitting at the table would slit the victim's throat to ensure the death of this person. At this point, there's a trap door to the basement that they would open up under their chair, which you gotta, how do you not see that? Look at the floor, there's some trap doors, don't be sitting on doors. Maybe there's a rug? Maybe mm. maybe there was a rug. Then but you they, gotta clean it all the time. Right, so they open the door, they slip the body down, 
And from the basement, the family would then take all of the victim's belongings, the clothes. They would then bury them somewhere in one of the mass graves out in the yard. Now, a desire for wealth was part of why the killing started. However, some of their victims didn't really have any money, showing that perhaps, and to your question, Fredo, maybe they just simply enjoyed the act. Enjoyed killing people. Now, before we get to the theories, I want to talk about some of the other victims that we didn't talk about, just to give you an idea of mm -hmm. how expansive this really was. So in May of 1871, the body of a man named Mr. Jones was found in Drum Creek near the Bender property. In February of 1872, two more unidentified men were found with the same injuries. People continued to go missing from the Osage Trail, so travelers began avoiding the trail entirely. Then in December of 1872, this is where they went buck wild. 16 victims went missing, so they were kind of oh spotty. Oh my God. Yeah. One in May of 1871, then two in Feb of 1872, 16 now, December 1872. We have Johnny Boyle, who was found in the Bender's well. We have W.F. McCrotty, Henry McKenzie, George Newton Longcourt and his daughter Marianne, who we talked about earlier, Ben Brown, John Greary, Red Smith, Abigail Roberts, who were all found buried in the Bender's apple orchard. There were various body parts found that are believed to belong to at least three different victims, and then there's, in addition to all of that, four more unidentified males with crushed skulls and throats cut. One may have been a man by the name of Jack Bogart, who went missing in that time frame. Mm -hmm. Then in May of 1873, Dr. William York went missing and was found in the apple orchard. The Benders killed around a dozen people, but it is rumored that as many as 40, if not more, victims of the Benders were never found. So I keep teasing the idea of this bonus theory is Bender the name of this family? We'll get into all that. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But before we do, I want to dive into the thick and proper theories that okay. address mm -hmm. some good, good details. So, theory number one, the Benders were murdered by locals. This is a pretty popular theory. However, it's very hard to figure out because a lot of people came forward with pretty strong stories as to how they killed the Bender family. <laughs> Dude, weird times. Weird times. It, I, they're gone. Don't worry, officer. I took care of them. I got them. I got them. You I got them good. You too, huh? <laughs> we'll stick you in the got them room. There's about 16 <laughs> dudes in there saying we got them. <laughs> what the hell? So we have several groups of vigilantes who were formed to search for the benders, each group concluding a different story about the benders' fate. One vigilante group claimed to have caught the benders and shot all of them except Kate, who was then burned alive. Another group claimed that they caught the Benders and then lynched them before throwing their bodies into the Verdigree River. Another group still claimed to have killed the Benders during a gunfight and buried their bodies on a prairie somewhere. To be more specific, there was a man named George Downer who lived in Independence, Kansas, and in April of 1873, he joined Colonel York's search party. After being pronounced terminally ill in 1909, Downer wanted to, quote, ease his soul of a secret too heavy and fearsome to carry to the eternal silence of the grave. Pause. Man, did we miss poetry. People just had way with words back then. Yeah. yeah that was kind of gorgeous. Yeah, it was. So during his final hour, he summoned a lawyer as well as some of his friends. There he confessed to helping capture and kill the Benders. His wife helped him retell the story as Mr. Downer struggled to speak. He passed away during the retelling of his story, but his statement was put in writing and the witnesses swore to it. It's just so many things about this, like this whole entire episode. Mm -hmm. I mean, if this is believed to be true, passed away while he was telling the story. Yeah, this was on his like final hour on his deathbed. He wanted to get rid of Man, this the timing. guilt. Um, so they're saying that he helped uh, the brothers. So he, yeah, he was part of the York brothers kind of search party and, and specifically Colonel York's search party. Yeah, so he so was there on site and it's got, possible. And with this theory, they got redemption. Sounds like it. Okay. And it sounds like, and I, if I'm to expand on this, mm -hmm. maybe they kept it secret because again, both the York brothers to Dr. York were in the Senate and right. it might be a huge faux pas for a senator of Kansas to go running off after a murderous family mm -hmm. to then do some justice. I mean, that's some Harvey Dent Batman stuff. It very much is. Um, and then the previous other like groups, there's a lot of money, $2,000, mm -hmm. which is like $50,000 mm -hmm. today. So that makes a lot of sense as to why like 
they're like making up stories. Right. But I feel like you can just easily shave those off the list. Like you didn't bring any piece of clothing or anything. No evidence. Point us to that spot in the prairie. Point us to where you buried them. Where you bury them. Like where this take place. None of that. And so it's like, yeah, okay, well, you're lying. Yeah. It's it's hard to know, right? Because like some of these you want to believe. Because you want to know that this murderous family found an end. That they wouldn't continue going right. on and killing people. But even if your intent was to be like, I'm going to put these people, like uh, either like someone that I know or someone close to me was, you know, murdered or a uh, part uh, of everything that went down. The money at that point is still something you're going to want. Mm-hmm. You're not going to be like, I found justice for my family. I don't need the money. It's like you just that's right. the icing on the cake. You take that. Right. Um so yeah. I, if uh, nothing else, you tell people so that way the search can end. Yeah. Right. True. And that many grieving families can know that there was at least oh, yeah. some ending. Oh yeah. Right? Definitely. Or justice. Now there was another man. Now he goes by the name of Harker, but this is how flimsy our, our history is. It, it's also known as Hooker. I don't know if there is a nickname in play or if it's just an uncertain name based on different references, but Harker, a.k.a. Hooker, shared a similar story to Downers. He, too, confessed to hunting down and killing the benders. They found several thousand dollars on the benders and then split it amongst the people that were hunting them. Harker claimed he and his friends gathered around the benders' bodies and realized it had been an execution without due process of law, and they could then themselves be charged with murder, so... They buried the benders and covered their tracks. They swore to one another under God that they would never tell another soul what happened that day. And oh, then I guess, yeah, I guess Parker the reward, broke that. Yeah, the reward was to find them, not to murder them. Yeah, it, it, it appears that the reward money, there was re- reward money for tracking them down yeah. is how it's put. Yeah, yeah. I just checked. It was a reward for the family's arrest. Got it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then if you actually murder them, then you can get in trouble too. Right. So, all right. It starts to make sense as to why you wouldn't want to be like, hey, here right. we are. These last two do feel, you know, pretty solid. But again, mm-hmm. it's really, really hard to say. Okay. It's just, that's just gut instinct speaking. But despite all these confessions, no bodies were ever found, which led many to believe that the benders must have escaped. Ultimately, no one ever collected that reward money. But... That does take us nicely into the next theory. Did this family, did the Benders, successfully flee from Cherryvale without arrest? And if so, where did they go? So detectives followed the wagon tracks, which led them to the horses that we talked about. Yep. But it did, in fact, also lead them to the Benders' abandoned wagon. There's your answer for where it went. Oh. They also found the horses, as I mentioned, near the city of Thayer, which was, again, 12 miles north of the Bender Inn. A ticket seller there, obviously selling tickets to trains and all of that, they said that they sold tickets to a group who matched the Bender's descriptions on the Leavenworth, Lawrence, and Galveston Railroad for Humboldt. So basically, he sold this family tickets on a train to Humboldt. At Chanute, John Jr. and Kate supposedly switched to a different train, the MKNT, going south to the end of the rail in Red River County near Denison, Texas. So now we know potentially that the family might have split into two groups of two. Uh Junior and Kate then traveled to an outlaw colony thought to be in the border region between Texas and New Mexico. A detective later claimed that he had traced the pair to the border where he found that John Jr. had died of a stroke. Jumping back now to John Sr. and Elvira Bender, supposedly they did not leave the train at Humboldt, but instead continued north to Kansas City, where it is believed that they purchased tickets for St. Louis, Missouri. In 1884, an elderly man who looked just like John Sr. was actually arrested for murder, of all things, in Idaho. While waiting for confirmation of his identity from Kansas, the man severed his own foot in an attempt to escape prison and passed away from blood loss. Man tried to pull a saw. Wow. Yeah. Doesn't work. So to slow down real quick and to clarify, years later, a man in Idaho was arrested for murder and some people started going, hey, that guy looks like John Sr. Okay. So. Kansas needs to hit us back and let us know, is this the guy? Yes. Let's clarify this. But before they could, he cut his foot off trying to escape, right. passed away. So that was what I wanted to just kind of re-clarify. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. It was years later. It was, uh, it was a couple years later. I should clarify. It was 1884. So what is that, Christian? About a decade? Maybe a little over a decade? Uh, yeah, roughly. I mean, like, I feel... 
I mean, unless he he was really in his sixties, buckled down. He was known to not know English. Hmm. Right. Like mm -hmm. that, I feel like that's the tell right there. Right. How was, how well was he speaking English? Yeah. Was he well spoken in English? Was there an accent? A decade, you could try buckling it down, I guess. Right. And right. like really trying to learn English and really trying to shave off like your accent and everything. I don't know if that's even possible or how it's a good question. or whatnot. I don't know the intricacies of that. But yeah. Yeah, that's just the information I kind of was digging for right there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it could be what tips people off that maybe he not only looked like John Sr., but also maybe had a bit of that I mean, yeah. vocal effect. So, uh, yeah, he passed away. And then in fall of 1889, so five years now after this Idaho guy, a woman named Almira Griffith and her daughter, Sarah Eliza Davis, were arrested in Michigan for theft, but were later arrested again for the murder of Dr. York, same man that we talked about earlier. And now we have two women with totally different names. They bore an uncanny resemblance to Elvira and Kate Bender, which is why they were tried in Labette County for the murder of John T. James. Now, this is what's frustrating. Their defense counsel offered evidence of mistaken identity, and the prosecutor then dismissed them from the case. Ugh. So basically saying, just because they look similar means that this is just mistaken identity. Ooh. They're not, they don't look similar because they are the same people. Right. And that's the end of the trail as far as, we don't know where John, Ju oh, no, John Jr. had a stroke, stroke, supposedly. Yeah. yeah. So this would be the, the final trail, would be the mom and the daughter arrested and then released from the case. <sighs> what an episode. Mm -hmm. This one was good. This might be my, one of my favorites. This is a top three for me. It's a good one. I know we had talked about this, Christian, for quite some time. It's been on the table for a minute. Yeah, yeah, Gracie and Jillian had brought it up, and it was the the forest month and the haunted house month that yeah. kind of kept it on the table for a minute, but I'm really happy that we talked about it. Do you want me to dive now? I've been teasing it this whole episode about oh, the bonus theory. Yes, of course. Because this is going to really throw a lot of more, just a lot more questions at your mind. There are aliens the whole time. <laughs> some crazy damn Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's the thing. <laughs> There is a bonus theory, it's not super substantiated, but it's interesting, that the Benders may have been a fake family. Items found in the cabin showed that Kate and John Jr. may have not been in fact related whatsoever to John Sr. and Elvira, meaning that they weren't their kids. They were completely different people and that they operated as a family. Kate and John Jr. were said to have been in a relationship in fact, and that maybe they were posing as son and daughter. Mm hmm. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's, we can, we can, what, what? What? We can talk a little bit more what? about it. I heard you trying to process. <laughs> yeah. Just, all right. Yeah. So uh, that's okay. We'll dive into a little bit more. It's it's mm -hmm. it's stringy, but there's a few things. So there was a Bible with German notes found that belonged to a John Gebhardt, or perhaps John Jr.'s original name. To further this mystery, theories were shared by the community claiming that none of them were actually named Bender whatsoever. Elvira's birth name was said to be Almira Mark, a woman born in the Adirondack Mountains, which would be in New England, not across the seas in any sort of way. And so the fact that this revelation earlier on that she was actually fluent in English mm -hmm. surprised people because they thought if she's a German immigrant that she might have had some broken English or a heavy accent. Right. But this... If she's born in, in the New England area, okay, well now being fluent in English makes a whole lot of sense. Yes, it does. Other theories about her said that she practiced polyamory, which could be why this family had such unique characteristics, and that Kate Bender was actually her fifth child, so that, that little particular lineage of mother-daughter was real, but it was her fifth child named Eliza Griffith. And if that sounds familiar, that's because, in the, again, in the fall of 1889, there was a woman, Almira Griffith, and Sarah Eliza Davis. Those are the two people arrested in Michigan that were tried and looked uncannily like these two women, but then oh, were released on mistaken identity. Goodness. So these names coming back as Eliza Griffith kind of, I don't know if it adds weight to this theory or if it's kind of levying right. another theory, but it's interesting. Man, that's a... Ooh. Yeah. The last note I want to say, John Sr. is said to be named John... Flickinger, 
and uh, came from either the Netherlands or Germany. And a person by this name died of suicide in Michigan. So it's potential that they they took this name from oh, somebody, right? Yeah, like a piece away. of identity theft. Mm -hmm. But the reason why I'm so fascinated by this particular theory is it it only drums up more questions on top of the questions that you've already posed. What's the motive? That's money. But if they're really not getting a lot of money, what brought this family together? Yeah. Because then they scattered to the wind, and mm -hmm. then the mother daughter, who might have actually been a mother daughter, may have been found in Michigan together. Like reconnected because at first the siblings broke off. Right. Right. And were, were the siblings actually a couple? Right. And then where's the siblings this that were John's, you know, getting together? Right. Because they were siblings. Mm -hmm. And then when's where's John Senior coming to picture? It's just. Ooh. Yeah. So it, it could have been not so a structured family as we thought it was right man what a wild ride it's yeah. also worth noting that kind of as a another bullet point to add to this theory is almira mark slash elvira was rumored i was proven to have been married multiple times but was rumored to have murdered multiple of her past husbands but it was never proven got it mm. man there's a dark past with these folks did they meet under like i don't know killers anonymous or something <laughs> That's what I'm like saying. <laughs> Hey, I need a group. I can't do this alone anymore. <laughs> I'm just just don't marry me. I might I might come after you. I guess they're I mean they're also pulled in 12 other people. Yeah, that that's true. Blows my mind. Now now like we start how much money are you really getting? Right. That you're like 12 people are like, this is lucrative. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I mean, I feel like you had a better business having an inn on a very yeah. popular trail, but then you shot your business literally in the foot by Killing the business mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. scaring everybody off the trail. It was a very commonly uh, yeah, commuted path. Burying the bodies or placing the bodies all around your land. People are eating those apples, man. Come on. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah, this starts to pluck on some cult strings that that kind of... I don't know. I, I'd be really interested to hear somebody who actually knows more about cults and is educated in that arena to like speak to this. Because if it's kind of completely unrelated people, it's like a mother and a daughter... And then this potential son-in-law, and then this guy from either the Netherlands or Germany shows up, and then right. we got 12 other people. Like, how did this all come together? What kind of drew them together to do these sinister deeds? It, it, it's just, I don't know. It's morbidly fascinating. It is such a unique and interesting story. Now you see why I think it should be a film, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, almost definitely. That's that's some real you Texas even have Chainsaw Massacre multiple stuff. Multiple different endings you can choose. Yeah. There's an episode of Supernatural that's very loosely based off of this. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I should have been to watch Supernatural when I just have nothing to watch again. That's a good show. Good luck not good having show. anything to watch again. I feel like I can never catch <laughs> that's up. That's true. It's like a yeah. treadmill with Lego yeah. bricks on it. Just, <laughs> I'll never be able to catch up. I do want to say, going back to what you said, Alfredo, about, about the, the potential. Spam? Yeah, about the spam. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the idea of uh, people joining this killer group for money. It could be worth noting that, you know, this happened in 1872, which was on the precipice of the what's called the Long Depression, which was mm -hmm. an economic crisis that came right after the Civil War started in 1873. Mm. So that could be a point in your right. favor of saying, you know, people are at the lowest of lows. Yeah. yeah. Desperation. Uh, yeah. Complete desperation. Damn. That's that's wild. I don't know, man. Like it, it really casts an interesting shadow on um on history, just when you like think of it through a lens like this. Yeah, I I do love too that there was the two stories on the deathbed when you were like, and then mm -hmm. there was another person who also had a story on their deathbed. I was like, oh come on! But it yeah. was like, oh no 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 no. One was like working for um the brother who was a senate. Yeah, and then the other the one, York. yeah, Colonel York, and then the other one was like. Yo, we were supposed to capture them. We accidentally murdered them. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to jail for this. Yeah, they were like, this was a... Uh, like, okay. This was a murder. All right. This was Similar, a, but ooh, unique. Yeah. In its own right. This has got to be one of my favorites. This it's was, a juicy this one. Was, this was a wild ride. I, I could not... I thought it was like, okay, pretty cool premise. Sounds like it's going to be straightforward. They just murdered people, how they get caught, and that's mm -hmm. it. But my God, the people involved, the, the doctor... The good doctor. The good doctor, the man. The good doctor neighbor. And then... Trying to look after Longcord and his, and and his daughter. And, and then he himself wow. got caught in the same spot. Yeah. It's a good one. It is a good one. Well, all the more reasons to uh, 
initiate building the new the new arm the new wing red web films uh we we were, well christian it's been a minute uh the studio is under construction so yeah i've been getting a lot of messages and i've been on vacation and it's yeah it's yeah yeah we up. definitely didn't want to yeah. leave you in we okay. wanted to surprise yeah. you but well, we we get, color we, me surprised we yeah. need like our little like production company like little like uh intro bit okay right. uh, christian we're gonna cool, need cool, you to cool, say cool, this cool, is a cool, red cool, web cool, production cool, cool. yeah yeah yeah, yeah, nope. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. we already got we got plenty of rooster teeth production at yeah, the top. yeah my two weeks notice no our canary our canary back out bail uh well let me go ahead and distract you the fact that this building has uh passed no codes and has not had an inspection yet. I'd expect um, nothing more. Let's turn you, let's turn his attention that way. <laughs> um, no, but this was a really interesting one. I'm really happy we finally got to cover it. I feel like I end most episodes with that now because that's the whole point of this show is just talking about these morbidly fascinating cases, whether it be intriguing stories about cryptids like Mothman or Squonk, all the way to true crime topics like this. We're just like the most like up to date mysteries. Yeah. Like the digital one. Oh, yeah. That's uh, my favorite. Digital cryptid. Yeah, last week. I think it was last week we did Loeb. That was which last week, yeah. Could be I'm sad I missed that one. I that know. That was wild, man. Yeah. Could be considered Oof. one of the internet's first cryptids. Don't like it. Get off of my hard drive. You spooky. thought you could escape. Leave my oh. GPU alone. It was spooky. Oof. Oof. I yeah. don't like it. <laughs> All right. Well, Task Force, thanks for listening. As always, really appreciate your continued support, whether it be with the merch at store.roosterteeth.com or with all those five-star reviews that keep pouring in. You guys are fantastic, and it enables us to continue building on Red Web in a more serious way, not in a building our right. face sort of way. But <laughs> yeah. like, we got case files going on now. We have uh, we we were able to go to Pennhurst Asylum yep, and really make a killer amazing. ghost hunt. All sorts of stuff like that. But Fredo, see you right back here next week for yet another mystery.